Following the Battle of Bunker Hill, the situation in Boston stalemated. The militia could neither storm Boston nor cut it off from resupply by sea, but British General William Howe couldn't break out either. The ferocious resistance on Bunker Hill made clear that he needed overwhelming numbers and significant amounts of artillery to break the militia, neither of which were available. With his overstretched supply lines struggling to keep the soldiers and civilians in Boston fed, sheltered and warm as winter approached, Howe realized that his only choice was to wait for spring. However, the nascent Army of the United Colonies, commanded by General George Washington, had other ideas. The Siege of Boston had to be won before spring. This video was sponsored by our kind YouTube members and patrons. Becoming a YouTube member or patron is the best way to support our work, so we're now providing our supporters with exclusive videos to thank them. Join their ranks to watch the Pacific War series, alongside the First Punic War, Sulla's biography, the Italian War of Unification, Risorgimento, the Russo-Japanese War, Albigensian Crusade, History of Prussia, and much more. 80 or so exclusive videos in total. In 2024, YouTube members and patrons will watch series on the Fall of Sparta, the Reconquista, Second Punic War, Spanish War of Succession, and Russian Civil War, and will continue getting early access to all videos, access to an exclusive Discord server, will know our schedule, and vote on future videos. YouTube member and patron support allows us to keep the majority of our videos free in a world where YouTube monetization income is very uneven. If you want to support our work, join their ranks today via the link in the description and pinned comment. Thank you! In October 1775, Prime Minister Lord North began restructuring his cabinet for war. Most importantly, his longtime ally George Germain became Secretary of State for the American Department in November. Alongside First Lord of the Admiralty Lord Sandwich, Germain was delegated responsibility for fighting the war against the rebelling colonies. The strategy the three men decided upon relied upon three key assumptions. First, the Americans could not withstand a direct assault by the British military. Second, the war could be fought the same way as European wars. And third, victory would bring loyalty. The campaign of 1776 would show them just how wrong they were. Supply problems were not unique to the British during fall and winter 1775, as Congress struggled to support Washington. Lacking taxation powers, it was forced to cajole its member legislatures to supply and pay the regiments based in their colonies themselves. Many legislatures were reluctant or unable to do so, resulting in chronic shortages of pay and supplies. Meanwhile, Washington's efforts to transform the disparate militia companies outside Boston into a unified, disciplined and European-style professional army were bearing some but insufficient fruit. Independently-minded part-time soldiers don't readily take to military discipline, nor did their officers respect chain of command. Company size, equipment, command structure, and even fighting style varied wildly. Standardizing this chaos was a military necessity, but the former militiamen resisted so stridently that Washington was forced to negotiate and compromise with them about not only their equipment and structure, but if they'd train and drill. Fortunately, by March 1776, a combination of new willing recruits and a campaign of harsh discipline forged something which started to resemble an army. Congress had more success at sea. While it would be impossible to challenge the Royal Navy's dominance, harassing and, more importantly, capturing British supply ships was critically important. Washington and the Rhode Island Assembly had already requisitioned a number of ships for this purpose. In October, Congress voted to create the Continental Navy. Congress also readily issued letters of mark and reprisal to privateers, who eagerly attacked British shipping heading for Boston. To break the stalemate, in November, Washington dispatched Henry Knox to retrieve the heavy cannons captured at Fort Ticonderoga. Knox set out with his noble train of artillery from Ticonderoga on December 17th arriving at Washington's headquarters in Cambridge on January 27th. While all 59 cannons were desperately needed, Washington had particular plans for the 24-pounder siege cannons. The easiest way to drive Howe from Boston was to fortify the unoccupied Dorchester Heights with heavy cannons, giving the Continentals effective fire control over the entire harbour and cutting Howe's supply line. However, Washington knew the British would contest any activity on the heights, and didn't believe his 1775 army would hold. Even if they could, 
he didn't have the right cannons to threaten the harbour. Knox's arrival and a major shipment of powder in February fixed those problems. Howe was aware of the threat, which was why General Thomas Gage's planned breakout in June called for seizing the heights. However, Bunker Hill and subsequent probing raids made clear that taking the heights was too risky. However, Howe made plans to attack anyway should the Continentals attempt to seize the heights. On the night of March 2nd, Washington ordered batteries stationed in Roxbury to open fire at British positions on the Boston Neck, which drew return fire. Neither bombardment did appreciable damage, but British attention was drawn. The action was repeated on the 3rd. Then, as their batteries fired on March 4th, 2,500 troops under General John Thomas rushed the Dorchester Heights, carrying pre-made gun positions, fortifications and siege cannons, using the bombardment and rows of hay bales to mask their movement and work. By 4am on the 5th, the gun positions were ready. Howe gave immediate orders to prepare a night attack against the Heights. However, nature intervened. A snowstorm blew into Boston that afternoon and didn't let up until the 7th. And by the 8th, Howe concluded that any opportunity to attack was gone and that preserving his army was more important. That afternoon, Howe sent an unsigned letter to Washington via intermediaries saying he would burn Boston if his army weren't allowed to evacuate unmolested. As it was unsigned and didn't address him or his rank, Washington formally rejected the letter but did unofficially agree. For the next week, Howe's army and the Boston loyalists gradually loaded into transports, waiting for favorable winds. They also looted all the linen and woolen goods in town. The wind finally blew in Howe's favor on March 17th, and by 9 a.m. the British had fully departed Boston for Halifax. Washington's privateers under Captain John Manley harassed the retreating British, managing to recapture the looted cloth and other supplies. For several weeks thereafter, British supply and reinforcement ships would obliviously sail into Boston and be captured, despite Royal Navy patrols trying to warn them away. Despite calls to do so from subordinates and London, Howe couldn't immediately counterattack. He agreed with pre-war assessments from Gage that subduing the colonies would require not only the full British Army and Navy, but extensive German auxiliary troops. Lord North and Secretary Germain reluctantly but ultimately agreed, and began recruiting new regulars and hiring troops from German states in late 1775. As the largest contingents came from Hesse Kassel and Hesse Hanau, they became collectively known as Hessians. While awaiting their arrival in Halifax, Howe planned the next campaign, targeting the strategic port of New York, alongside his older brother and naval theatre commander, Admiral Richard Howe. Washington anticipated the move, and in February dispatched his second-in-command, General Charles Lee, to New York City to prepare the defences. Lee quickly concluded that it would be impossible to hold New York from any determined attack as there were simply too many places to land troops once the Royal Navy controlled the harbour. Thus, rather than attempting to hold the city, he arranged the defences to make taking the city as costly as possible. Washington arrived in April and agreed with Lee's assessment. However, he was under strict orders from Congress to defend New York. Thus, he expanded the defences and built a chain of forts along the harbour, islands and rivers to deter a British attack. Unfortunately, this required him to spread out his already understrength army and fill the gaps with local militia. Before we go further, it's important to note that every revolution is also, at least to some extent, a civil war. The conflict between anti-parliament patriots and pro-parliament loyalists is heavily overshadowed by the war between the British military and nascent continental army, but no less important. In 1763, nearly every person in the 13 colonies considered themselves as English as those in England itself. As the 12-year-long crisis unfolded, that attitude slowly changed. By the time of Bunker Hill, the Loyalist population had fallen to no more than 20% of the total, with 40-45% to actively supporting the Patriot cause. Over the course of 1775, Patriot and Loyalist militias clashed throughout the colonies, with the more numerous and better organized patriots driving out the royal governors and their supporters. 
By January 1776, the Patriots had taken control of every colony and forced every vocal loyalist to seek protection from the British military. Simultaneous with the Patriots' ascension, the colonies learned that King George III had authorized hiring the Hessians. This crushed many Americans' last shred of hope that Parliament and the King would see them as equal citizens rather than colonial subjects. In January, Thomas Paine's common sense gave the final push necessary to embrace the previously fringe thought of independence. On June 11th, Congress authorized a committee of five to write the Declaration of Independence. The task of actually drafting it fell to Thomas Jefferson, who locked himself away to write until June 28th. After some basic edits and proofreading, the document was turned over to Congress, which spent the next two days revising and shortening the document. On July 1st, the finalized document was moved to open debate, with the final vote to approve taken on July 2nd. The United Colonies were now the United States. As news spread, wild celebrations followed throughout the colonies, accompanied by statues of the King and other British officials being torn down. George Washington received the declaration on July 9th and held a parade for his soldiers to hear and read it. He needed them to understand the stakes they were fighting for, as the long-expected storm had arrived. By late May, the Howes had received sufficient reinforcements and sailed from Halifax on June 9th. The plan called for Admiral Howe and the Navy to seize New York Harbor, after which General Howe's soldiers would drive the rebels from the city. Secretly, the brothers hoped that the appearance of 130 warships carrying 20,000 troops would be sufficient to intimidate the Continentals into surrender. Failing that, they hoped to negotiate peace with the colonies. However, Lord North insisted that the colonies must accept parliamentary supremacy and return to the status quo pre-Concord, intolerable acts and all. The only offer the Howes could make was pardons. On June 29th, 45 warships took control of Lower New York Bay. The rest of the fleet trickled in over the next three days. On July 2nd, Howe began landing soldiers on sparsely populated and defended Staten Island. Washington anticipated that the next target would be Manhattan, and moved the bulk of his forces there. General Howe waited instead. On July 13th, the Howes attempted to open negotiations with Washington. However, his letter was rejected for being incorrectly addressed to George Washington Esquire rather than General George Washington. Washington finally agreed to meet with Howe's adjutant on July 20th, but when told that all Howe had to offer was pardons, Washington rejected the overture, saying, those who have committed no fault want no pardon. The standoff continued into August. On the 1st, Generals Henry Clinton and Charles Cornwallis arrived with the Caribbean fleet after failing to capture Charleston, South Carolina. On August 12th, the final expected contingent of Hessians arrived, bringing the army up to 32,000 men and the fleet to 400 ships. The time to attack had finally arrived. On August 22nd, General Howe ordered Clinton and Cornwallis to land at Gravesend Bay, south of Continental fortifications on Brooklyn Heights. By noon, 15,000 men and 40 artillery pieces had landed to the cheers of local loyalists. Washington's reports made it sound like a diversionary landing, so he only sent 1,500 reinforcements, bringing the Continental Army's local strength up to 6,000. On August 24th, Washington sent General Israel Putnam and an additional 4,000 troops to Brooklyn. The same day, 5,000 Hessians landed to reinforce Clinton. Putnam's plan was to refight the Battle of Bunker Hill. He'd keep 6,000 soldiers at Brooklyn Heights, while the rest moved south onto Guan Heights, between Brooklyn and Clinton's camp. The three roads through the hills were fortified, with the intention of inflicting as many casualties as possible before falling back to Brooklyn Heights. However, Clinton refused to repeat Bunker Hill and scouted for alternatives. Local loyalists informed him of a seldom used fourth road, Jamaica Pass, far to the east. The Continentals hadn't fortified it, either due to troop shortages or oversight. Clinton proposed to send 10,000 men on a night march through Jamaica Pass, while General James Grant attacked the Continental right as a diversion. Once the main force was in position, the Hessians would attack the Continental center while Clinton turned their flank. Howe approved the plan on August 26th, 
ordering Clinton to proceed immediately. The flanking column moved out at 2100. Guided by loyalist farmers, the column moved undetected, capturing five militia watching the pass without firing a shot. By dawn, the column was in position. Grant's diversion began at 0100 on August 27th. After pushing back the American sentries, Grant's men attempted to force the road, but were repelled by Brigadier William Alexander's brigade. The British regrouped and attempted to outflank the position using the hills to the continental left, only to be driven off by a counterattack. By 0900, Washington had arrived with reinforcements, only now realizing that Long Island was the actual target, not a feint. At the same time, Clinton fired two heavy cannons to signal the Hessians to attack. The ferocity and size of both frontal attacks convinced the Continentals that these were the main attacks, leaving them completely oblivious to Clinton's column until it suddenly appeared in the rear. Despite efforts by General John Sullivan to turn his men to meet the attack, panic gripped the line and many simply fled for Brooklyn Heights. Through the chaos, Sullivan managed to disengage most of his force and get them to safety, though he was captured in the process. On the right, Alexander's heavily engaged troops thought they were winning the battle after successfully repulsing Grant. However, Grant received reinforcements and launched a new attack just as the Hessians swung into Alexander's left, forcing him back. By now, Clinton's advance had cut off all avenues of retreat, except for one across Brewer's Mill Pond. The entire force might have been annihilated, but for Alexander and 270 men from the 1st Maryland Regiment. Facing 2,000 British regulars behind cover, the Marylanders charged twice, buying enough time for the rest of the army to retreat. Only 12 Marylanders returned to Washington's lines. By noon, the British had swept the Continentals into Brooklyn Heights. Howe ordered a halt, despite protests from his officers to attack while they still had momentum. However, Howe refused to waste troops attacking prepared positions, and so began constructing siege lines. Initially, Washington thought to hold the heights, but the speed the British showed in building siege lines on the 28th convinced him to retreat. With rain falling that afternoon, Washington gave orders to procure every barge and sloop available and assigned Colonel John Glover's regiment to row the army across the East River to Manhattan and safety. At 2300 on August 29th, the evacuation began, covered by rain and fog. By 0700, the evacuation was complete with Washington the last American to leave Long Island. Howe was shocked by the withdrawal's speed and began carefully planning his next move. Meanwhile, Washington regrouped while desperately trying to learn Howe's intentions. In an effort to strike the fleet, on September 7th, Washington authorized the first known attack by a submersible in history when the Turtle, piloted by Sergeant Ezra Lee, unsuccessfully attempted to destroy Admiral Howe's flagship. On September 15th, Howe's landing at Kipps Bay succeeded. A skirmish on the Harlem Heights again convinced Howe not to directly attack the Americans, instead looking for another landing point to outflank and trap Washington in Manhattan. After a failed attempt on October 12th, he succeeded in an opposed landing at Pelham on the 18th. Realizing the danger, Washington evacuated Manhattan to regroup at White Plains. On October 28th, Howe attacked again. While Continental regulars repulsed the initial attacks, the militia on the right were scattered by Hessians under Colonel Johann Roll, forcing the rest of the army to withdraw. At this point, Howe split his army, directing Cornwallis to chase Washington and Clinton to take undefended New Jersey while he went back to finish off Continental holdouts in New York. By early December, Washington was driven into Pennsylvania and New York City was firmly in British hands. 4,000 prisoners taken in the campaign were crowded onto prison hulks in the harbor, where half would perish from malnutrition and disease. After their decisive victory, the British prepared to move into winter quarters and shelter themselves from the cold. On the other side, Washington could afford his men no such luxury. After the heavy defeat in New York, the Continental Army was in crisis. Casualties and desertion had reduced his force to under 5,000 hungry and unpaid soldiers. Morale was non-existent, and worse, most enlistments would end on January 1st. Unless recruiting picked up dramatically, or there was a miraculous mass re-enlistment, the Continental Army would cease to exist. Washington needed a victory now to save his army. 
Unfortunately, the British handed him an opportunity. Cornwallis and Clinton had established a chain of garrisons along the Delaware River and New Jersey interior. Howe deliberately spread his winter garrisons out to attract as many Loyalist militia as possible to support his planned spring campaigns against Albany and Philadelphia. The Continental Army was believed too defeated to pose any threat. In particular, 1,500 Hessians stationed at Trenton under Colonel Rull were particularly isolated, their supply and communication lines under pressure from Continental patrols and militia raiders. When the nearest support left their post to chase the raiders, the time came to strike. Rall was on edge from the constant harassment, and British spies had warned that Washington was making plans. Thus, Continental agents in Trenton worked to make the Hessians as relaxed and confident as possible. To complete the ruse, Washington arranged for an agent posing as a Tory to be captured and subsequently escape to Trenton, to deceive Rall that Washington's army was in no state to fight. It worked, and despite private misgivings, Rawl publicly dismissed any chance of attack and made no defensive preparations. Washington planned to cross the Delaware River and attack Trenton before dawn on December 26th, hoping the garrison would still be drunk from Christmas celebrations. Two columns under General Sullivan and Nathaniel Green, 2,400 strong, would attack Trenton from the north and south. Pennsylvania militia would block the road south, while a detachment of regulars caused a diversion at Bordentown. On Christmas night, Washington ordered the march to the river, with the password, Victory or Death. As Glover's men began ferrying the assault forces across, freezing rain began to fall. Coupled with the river being partially frozen, the crossing wasn't complete until 0300, and the army wasn't ready to march until 0400, making a pre-dawn strike impossible. Worse, the blocking forces never made it across the river. However, Washington had no choice but to press ahead, riding up and down the column to encourage his men onward. By 0800, the Continentals were in position. Washington personally led Green's northern column from the front, quickly overrunning the outlying Hessian outposts. The Hessians attempted a disciplined fighting retreat, but the Continentals advanced too rapidly. Meanwhile, Sullivan's column moved to block the bridge over Assinpink Creek before assaulting the town. The Hessians attempted to form battle lines and hold the streets, but Washington's artillery quickly cleared them off. Rawl awoke to the Continentals overrunning Trenton. Lurching into action, he ordered his officers to form up the men and repulse the rebels. However, his men had already fallen back to a field outside of town. After catching up, Rawl ordered them to reform and recapture the town. It was a disaster, as he took fire from three sides, and for reasons unclear, the Hessians' muskets failed to fire. As the formation broke, Rawl was mortally wounded. His surrounded men either fled or surrendered. With only two dead of exposure and five wounded, in under an hour, Washington had killed 22 Hessians, wounded 83, and taken 900 prisoners. He had claimed the victory he so desperately needed, but the crisis wasn't over. On December 31st, Washington gathered the men about to muster out and extolled them to stay for at least another month. It took an extremely patriotic speech and an extra $10 pay, but most agreed to stay. It was not a moment too soon. After learning about Trenton on December 27th, Cornwallis cancelled his leave to Britain and marched 8,000 troops out of New York to meet General Grant in Princeton, strengthening garrisons as he went. Determined to attack Washington and avenge Trenton, Cornwallis left 1,400 men in Princeton and marched to Trenton with 5,000. Throughout January 2nd, the British gradually pushed through American patrols and outposts until they reached Assinpink Creek south of Trenton in the late afternoon. Three waves of attacks failed to cross the creek and reach Washington's defenses, so Cornwallis retired for the night. Washington ordered a night march around Cornwallis to attack Princeton on January 3rd, successfully overwhelming the garrison and capturing Cornwallis's supplies. Washington then fell back to Morristown, finally entering winter quarters. In 10 crucial days, he had completely turned the Continental Army's fortunes around. Disturbed by the Continental's resilience, the British abandoned central New Jersey, falling back to New Brunswick, 
and a ring of garrisons around New York to wait for spring while Hal planned his war-winning campaign. In the next episode, we will talk about the aftermath of the battles of Trenton and Princeton and much more. Make sure you are subscribed and have pressed the bell button to ensure you don't miss it. Recently, we've started releasing weekly patron and YouTube member exclusive content. Consider joining their ranks via the link in the description or button under the video to watch these weekly videos, learn about our schedule, get early access to our videos, access our private Discord, and much more. This is the Kings and Generals channel, and we will catch you on the next one.